I think every subscriber to my channel knows exactly what's inside this box right here. This is my Dell R7610, more commonly known as Craft Computing's failed cloud gaming server. Now, it's not that I failed in the concept, in fact I proved that it could work, the thing is it just didn't work very well, and I thought part 3 was dead in the water. That is until a viewer reached out with a very interesting donation, which we'll get into very shortly. But for the last couple of weeks, I have been scouring the internet and stocking up on parts to do a brand new, oh god, this one's heavy, a brand new server build to re-explore the concept. And I promise you, this build is going to be pretty epic. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff, and we've got a lot of unboxing and building to do today, so what do you say we get right down to business? Right on top of this server right here are my Tesla K10 and Grid K2 cards. Now, these are the cards that I purchased for about $40 a piece that started this whole project off. As you remember, in parts 1 and 2, I explored these cards and then did a resistor and BIOS modification on these so the Tesla K10s would recognize as a Grid K2 and enable NVIDIA Grid support inside supported virtualization machines. In short, I made these cards able to play games remotely. But the system never really quite worked the way I wanted it to, and in part 3, I did my full-on testing with four virtual machines running four different graphics cards, and the results were, well, lackluster at best. I saw the frame rates in some games jump easily to 60 FPS. However, there was so much stuttering across the board on every single streaming system, the server as a whole just was not usable. So I pretty much scrapped the project from there. So what could a fan have possibly donated to this channel to make me dive back into this project? Well, how about sending over not one, but two Tesla M60 GPUs with some interesting water cooling modifications. For those not familiar with the Tesla M60, I'll go ahead and fill you in on the details. Much like the Grid K2 and Tesla K10 I used before, this is still a dual GPU card with no video outputs on it. However, unlike those previous cards, this is using the GM104 GPU die. That's right, this is Maxwell-based instead of Kepler, sharing the same GPU dies as the GTX 980. Also, instead of a paltry 4GB per core, this doubles that all the way up to 8GB per video core, or 16GB per card. These cards can also draw just a little bit more power than before. Where a Grid K2 would cap out at 240 watts for the entire card, these will cap out at a full 300 watts, giving us much, much more power to work with when we're talking about virtual machines and GPU instances. But we're not quite ready to talk about these cards just yet, so make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you don't miss that future video. Instead, we're going to talk about the other three GPUs that I bought to see if I can breathe some new life into this project. And yeah, if you're keeping track, that's nine GPUs dedicated to this video series so far. Right around the time I was getting ready to film part three of this video series, I ran across a very interesting eBay auction in which they were selling a multitude of this card right here. Now, I had never owned one of these cards, and it's always been on my wish list to at least have on my shelf. So I went ahead and uh, bought three of them. Now, I'm sure you can already read that from there, but for those who can't, these are three GTX 690s. This is the consumer version of the Tesla K10 and Grid K2, and in fact is still a dual GPU card. There's two GPUs on there. The downside to these is there's only two gigabytes per GPU die for a total of four gigabytes on the card, but these ones do have video outputs. Now, I'm sure you're asking me right now, what makes this card so interesting? I see these on eBay all the time. Ah, yes you do but you've never seen them OEM factory fresh before. These cards have never been used. Yeah, how long has it been since you've seen a GTX 690 peel? I bet it's been a while. As someone who enjoys collecting hardware, these things are gorgeous. These are museum quality if you're into that kind of thing. Uh, this will definitely have a place of honor among us, some other video cards that I have in my collection, but this is uh, by far one of the nicest examples that I own. There's not a speck of dust, there's no oil, there's no leaking pads, there's no grime and grit and fingerprints all over everything. They are perfect, as if I opened the box in 2012. Come to think of it, 2020 is the year that 2012 dreamt of being. So how am I going to power up these three 300 watt behemoth video cards? Well, not with this. 
For starters, we're switching from a rack mount server over to a tower server, mainly for water cooling needs on the Tesla M60s when we get there. However, this is the Supermicro MBD H11 SSL I O. And for those who don't know what that means, that means that this is a first and second generation Epic certified SP3 socket motherboard. I picked up this motherboard brand new for about $385, and it is absolutely gorgeous. Well, if you're an enterprise nut like I am. But the reason I selected this motherboard was really twofold. Number one, it was one of the most affordable motherboards on the market for SP3, and it supports both first and second generation AMD EPIC processors, which means I can pick from any generation that I'd like and they'll slot right in. The second is actually the layout of the PCI Express slots. There are three PCI Express X16 slots on this board, each of them with one space beneath them, meaning that I can fit three full-size graphics cards onto this motherboard with no problems at all. That's not something to take for granted with even a single processor board, let alone a dual processor board like a, you know, a dual 2011 socket board. So what CPU goes into a beast of a motherboard like this? Well, if the GTX 690s were a good deal, this may be the holy grail that I have ever found on eBay. This is an AMD EPIC 7601. Now it is a first generation AMD EPIC, but this is their flagship model. This is their 32 core, 64 thread, 2.2 gigahertz with a 3.2 gigahertz turbo boost. This chip is insane. Not only is this chip insane, it's insanely expensive. When this chip came out brand new about two years ago, it was $5,000. It still sells brand new for $3,500. The cheapest auction that I could find on eBay was $1,350, I believe. I paid $699. 699 US dollars for 32 core 64 threads on what is still a current generation platform. And my favorite question to answer with it is, what are you gonna do with that kind of power? Games and stuff. For storage, we are scavenging what I had in the R7610, and I am pulling out the Firecuda 510 1TB NVMe drive, as well as the two Ironwolf Pro SSD 1.92TB drives. To cool this 180 watt chip, Noctua was kind enough to send over the NHU12S SP3 and TR4 edition cooler. This is the same NHU12S that you know and love, just with a TR4 base plate and mounting bracket built in. As far as what was in this heavy box here, well, RGB of course. Well, that and uh, an EVGA 1600T2 Supernova. Now I've seen a lot of people who bought 1600 watt power supplies for their computers and really didn't need them because they were running two 1080 Ti's and an SLI. It's like, ooh, 700 watts at max, bro. Careful there. Uh, that's 900 watts in graphics cards and another 200 watt in processor. Um, we're gonna be topping easily 1150 when this is all said and done, if not more, especially once we get full water cooling for the Tesla M60s going on. Uh, there's a lot of power going through this box. So honestly, a 1600 watt is totally warranted for this system. As far as what case I'm gonna use, I could think of nothing better than the Fractal Design Define 7, because we're gonna need both air cooling and water cooling support for the two iterations of the system that I'm going to run. And it just has a lot of room to work in. So with all that, Let's get this thing built.
So the heck with the beer after that build. I need an old fashioned. Oh, delightful. Where to start? Uh, how about, oh my God, that thing is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, this system is beyond my wildest expectations for how the looks could have gone, let alone the very early performance numbers I've gotten out of it. So the build itself obviously didn't go without some hangups, as I'm wearing different clothes, this is a different day. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I didn't quite expect some problems with the motherboard layout, in particular the SATA ports which face straight out rather than being bent at a 90 degree angle. Uh, the main problem with that is this lower graphics card and either graphics card number two right here actually overlap all of the SATA ports. And if I were to use a graphics card this long on this build, those SATA ports would be completely inaccessible. I did manage to get two of those SATA ports plugged in, and this graphics card is actually poking out just ever so slightly, but it is still firmly seated into the socket, so I don't think we're going to have any issues there. But it does definitely contact those SATA ports, and the cables are bent at a pretty extreme angle. So I don't necessarily know that I'd recommend this particular board for this exact 3 GPU setup. Now, the Supermicro board doesn't support SLI, so it's not really a plausible setup for most people anyway. But just something to keep in mind if you're looking at getting this motherboard and putting a couple large graphics cards in it, uh, you're going to want to make sure you have enough room for your SATA cables. The other problem I ran into is I wanted to run a separate boot disk from the NVMe drive and the two Iron Wolf SSDs that I have in here. Unfortunately, because I am blocking all of those SATA ports and I'm also blocking all of the other available PCI Express slots in here, that's not going to be possible, but I think I will make do with what I've got. As far as everything else, the CPU mounted right up, the cooler installed very, very easily into here, and uh, I love the removable panel for installing the top fans on the Define 7. It really made all of the cable management and accessibility in and around this motherboard and getting cables routed very, very simple. And honestly, the look turned out Again, better than I could have expected. Even the GPU cable runs, which are usually a point of contention with a lot of system builds like this, uh, route very nicely right around the corner. And uh, I think after just a little bit of training and maybe a couple of zip ties, those things will uh, turn out very, very nice. Going with the Fractal Design Define 7 was absolutely the right decision for this build. As again, I'm going with the EVGA Supernova 1600 watt, very, very oversized power supply. And it takes up a lot of room in the bottom of that case but there was still plenty of room for cable management for the almost dozen cables that I had to run out of that modular power supply. There are six here just for the GPUs, and each one of these is an individual run, so there's two per card instead of the dual eights coming off of a single set of headers. There's also the 24 pin, there's two EPSs coming up to this board, there's also one SATA plug in the back for powering some of the ancillary stuff like the fan hub and uh, the little bit of RGB lighting that I added inside. So how about some early performance numbers to hold you over until the next couple of videos? This Epic 7601 is a beast of a processor, and I knew it would be being AMD's previous flagship Epic CPU, but 32 core, 64 threads running at 2.2 gigahertz base clock and boosting up to 3.2 with a 2.7 gigahertz all core boost. It is absolutely insane on the performance metrics. Not only that, it does that at just 180 watts. And I was a little bit skeptical that the uh, NHU-12S would be able to keep it cool. But much to my surprise, that is absolutely the story here. And just for the record, we are running eight 8 gb 6 of Kingston 2133 ECC registered memory. I know it's not the fastest memory on the planet, but this is what I had on hand to get all eight channels activated. I do plan on hopefully upgrading to some 2666 or possibly some 3200 megahertz if it will allow me to overclock the memory, but we'll have to wait till that until a later video. Even with the memory holding us back a little bit, I still posted my fastest Cinemetch R15 score to date, posting a 4197 in multi-threaded. That is absolutely insane, beating my 16-core Threadripper 2950X by a full 800 points, and that thing's running at 4 gigahertz. To put that into perspective of what I was working with in my last cloud gaming server, that was running a pair of 2670 V2 10-core CPUs at 2.5 gigahertz, and that only managed a 2470 in Cinebench R15. So my 7601 is a full 68% faster. Cinebench R20 showed a very similar dominance, scoring a 9626 in multi-threaded performance. However, we did come crashing back to Earth a little bit when it came to single-threaded scores. In R15, it scored a 126, and in R20, it pulled up a 326. 
To put that into context again, that actually ties it with an i5-3570, which is pretty impressive in its own merit. However, it also puts it within spitting distance of a Ryzen 5 1600, 2600, and 2400G. And on the Intel side of things, it's actually very close with an i7-4770K at stock speeds and an i3-8100, all of which are very respectable gaming PCs. I also ran some very early temperature testing to make sure I was going to be okay, and because I can hear you already screaming at your monitor, there's no airflow between those GPUs, they're literally gonna melt inside this case. They're gonna be fine, relax. But we're gonna start with the CPU just to annoy you. Under a sustained Cinebench workload, our 7601 only peaked at 47 degrees Celsius, which is absolutely mind-blowing for a 180 watt CPU with 32 cores under the hood. As far as the GPUs, I ran GPU number one right here through SpecBeeperv, and much to my surprise, it peaked at just 77 degrees Celsius. Now obviously when I get the other GPUs involved, there is going to be more heat generated by the system and that temperature is definitely going to rise. However, the frequency never dropped below 1 GHz, and in fact it actually hit 1085 under boost clock, which is right in line with what I would expect with an open air system. So I don't think temperature is going to be much of an issue, and certainly is going to be enough for gaming. Given that each of these six GPUs inside the machine has the potential to run faster than a GTX 1050 Ti, I do expect very good things even if the temperatures rise to 80 or 85 degrees Celsius, but you'll have to stay tuned for those benchmarks in the next video. And that is going to do it for part four. I really hope this thing turns out to be a better cloud gaming system than my first attempt, but only time will tell and I guess parts five and six will tell. But make sure you're subscribed to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already so you don't miss the next episode. If you're interested in picking up any of the new parts inside of this build, I will have Amazon affiliate links down in the video description. And a huge shout out to companies who sent out parts to make this build possible. Noctua with the NHU12S, EVGA with the 1600 watt Supernova T2, and Fractal Design with the Define 7. It is much appreciated and links to those are also down there as well. As for me, I'm going to finish this cocktail, probably when I say thank you all for watching this video, and as always, I will see you in the next one. Cheers, guys. some brews. I have to pour my beers on camera. I can't get the head to look like that. Beer for today is the Six of Swords from Anchorage Brewing in Anchorage, Alaska. It is a 9.5% triple IPA. And the can has this good wolf, bad wolf, yin yang thing going on. I'm kind of digging that. Ooh, definitely a hazy. Wow. That looks like really, really thick pineapple juice. Smells like pineapple juice, in fact. Pineapple, guava, very, very tropical nose. Oh, and that is a thick one. Wow. Very, very thick body on this beer. A um, lot of little floaties in there. I don't know if that's just citrus floaties or some active yeast, but there's a lot of floaties up in this milk. Um, I know it's a hazy. It's probably a little bit of lactose in there too, but man, it's like the sea monkey colony of my dreams. Very good. Uh, it's an IPA, you wanna chew. And I usually don't use that as a good reference for an IPA, but uh, honestly, the body feel is just fantastic on this beer. Um, not a lot of hop flavor. Uh, maybe a little lingering towards the back end, but that that acidic finish of a lot of hazy beers is kind of fighting with the hops right now. Mostly this just takes like a really refreshing tropical punch. Um, it's actually quite good. Maybe refreshing is not quite the right word there. Uh, this isn't a refreshing beer, although it is very tropical, but it's very heavy bodied. This is like a steak, ribs, and burger kind of beer. Uh, this is a beer with a meal in it. I'm finishing up filming the B-roll for this video, but uh, I'm getting near the end of my beer, and this one Warren's talking about. I don't know if I'm getting more used to hazies or if I just started with some of the most aggressive acidic hazies in the batch of beers that are available. This one is very, very pleasant. There's still a little bit of acid burn in the back of my throat, but honestly, it's not detracting from the enjoyment of this beer. Um, it's definitely present. It's definitely something I notice. 
but it's not nearly the the same presence that it normally is. It's not burning my throat so I don't taste anything anymore. But I can still enjoy food with this and I'm still enjoying the flavor of this beer. So it might be me getting, you know, getting on the bandwagon for the trend finally, or uh, it might just be a really good hazy. But finishing this one off, very, very tropical. It's absolutely delicious. Uh, if you can find this one, Six of Swords from Anchorage, uh, totally pick one up. In fact, pretty much anything from Anchorage, go ahead and grab it because you know it's probably gonna be good. Um, I've had old fashions on the show before. Uh, this is the way I make them, and uh, it's one of my all-time favorite drinks. Uh, this is a very, very simple recipe. Anyone can do this at home. This is three ounces of a 100% rye whiskey, and I really do prefer a rye in an old fashion. It's three quarters of an ounce of Demerara syrup, and you can make that at home with Demerara sugar. Uh, it's uh, three to four dashes of Angostura bitters. I prefer a little heavy on the bitters. And then I usually toss in one dash of uh, orange bitters as well. And then on the top, you've just got a, an orange peel. You give it a squeeze, run it around the rim, and then drop it in the glass. And uh, it's honestly one of the most perfectly balanced cocktails that you can make. And it is so incredibly simple. Actually emptied the bottle tonight. Uh, this is a James Oliver rye whiskey. It is a 100 proof whiskey, uh, and it is quite tasty. It's nothing really special, although they do call it the bootleggers special. Uh, there's nothing really extraordinary about this, but it is just a solid mixing whiskey. Um, not so much a great sipper. I've, I've tried this uh, just straight up before, and and it's okay. Uh, there's a little bit of vanilla, there's a little bit of that peppercorn that you really enjoy with the rise, but it's nothing overly remarkable. But in a mixer, it's everything you're looking for in a rye whiskey. It's just good. It's citrusy, it's sweet, you still taste the rye, the whiskey, the little bit of pepper right in the back of your throat. The orange just kind of carries you all through that. This is just a delicious drink.